The day came for me to meet Raymond Davis, a 15-year-old teenager I had been assigned to get to know, to help explain why in God's name he killed a man in a cold-hearted act. Just before 7.30 that morning, I passed through the corridors towards Visitation 5, which is a glassed-in room I commonly inhabit when I evaluate young offenders. One of my favorite jailers, Ms. Ledford, greeted me. Good morning, Dr. C. Who are you seeing today? Raymond Davis, I said. Speaking into a two-way radio, she instructed the control room staff, Visitation 5, Visitation 5. A loud click sounded, and Ms. Ledford yanked on the metal door handle as I walked into a bland eight-by-eight-foot room with a table and three vanilla chairs. As I mechanically established a makeshift office, I spontaneously visualized looking down on a dead man whose spirit I had just blown to smithereens with a borrowed 38. I've never held one of those things. In fact, I don't even know how to shoot a gun, but surely a 38 is heavy. In a moment, Miss Ledford showed up with a handsome teenager walking dutifully behind her. He looked all of his 15 years in some odd days, but no more. I purposely refrain from shaking hands with offenders upon first meeting them, not because I'm rude or boorish, but as a way of respecting the gulf that stands between me, the examiner, and my client, the accused. Give us time to establish a rapport, and most likely we'll be on friendly terms, but not yet. I'm Dr. Carter Raymond. Were you aware I was coming to see you today? Yes, sir. They told me eight or 8.30. The implication was that 7.35 was not to his liking. I'm an early bird, sorry about that. I spent a few minutes taking care of housekeeping business, describing to Raymond my role in his case and informing him I may eventually have to testify about him in court. Raymond nodded his head as I spoke and promised to be completely open with me. Without question, just as I tried to read him, he was doing the same with me. No sooner had we completed our formalities Raymond told me, I shot this dude. I guess he was trying to make my job much simpler. I'll want to know more about that later, Raymond, but not now. We'll get there eventually, okay? Yes, sir, he said. You know, the kid really was polite. Somewhere along the line, he learned good manners from somebody. So tell me, Raymond, I asked, what prompted you to come to Waco? Nothing. I didn't have a place to stay in Memphis, and I wanted to find my daddy. So I just came. I heard that didn't go so well. Yeah, it was bad, he said. Voicing aloud what I thought Raymond might have been thinking, I said, I imagine you've assumed your father would be glad to see you, but I've read that within a week you and he had a blowout. What happened? He told me to get off my butt and go do something. I said something smart back to him. Something not so nice, I asked. Yes, sir, I guess. So you wound up with no place to go? Oh no, I have a girlfriend who let me stay with her. I'll probably go back to her sometime. Here we go. Should I keep my mouth shut and let somebody else, say his attorney or maybe the good Judge Collier, break the news to poor Raymond that he will never see his girlfriend again? It didn't take you long to find a girlfriend, I said. Raymond smiled, knowing he's a Casanova. It never does. Does she know where you are? Probably. Let's get back to you and your father. <clears throat> I'm aware you didn't know him before you came to Waco, but in the short time you lived with him, what did you learn? <clears throat> he likes drugs better than me, he said. You like drugs too? Not me, it's against the law. Okay, here we go again. Raymond would shoot and kill a man for $4, but he turns down marijuana because he doesn't want to break the rules. I figured I'd chase that rabbit and see which trail he traversed. Explain that, Raymond. You don't do drugs because it's against the law, but you've been in trouble for other violations. I only get in trouble when people make me mad, he explained. Now there's a diagnostically useful statement if there ever was one. Raymond admittedly breaks rules when he's mad. At its core, anger is a simple emotion, really. Something's wrong, someone tries to make things right, and they assert themselves. Done right, anger can clean up various ills. Once its task is accomplished, it can and should be shelved until the next crisis. But some people suppose that everything about life is wrong and they stay angry. I only get in trouble when people make me mad. That 
that's a lot of anger in this boy. Be honest with me, Raymond. You've been in trouble a fair amount. So if you only get in trouble when you're mad, something's not right. He didn't smile, really, but Raymond tipped his head back a bit and almost cracked his lips. Give us 30 minutes and we'll be on good terms. I continued, when you were a little boy, how did your mother discipline you? What did she say? What did she do? Echoing his mother, Cheryl's earlier confession, he said to me, nothing really. She didn't do nothing. She really wasn't there much. I saw her some and lived with her every now and then. My granny and my aunties, they disciplined me some, mostly by whipping me. Yeah, that's what it was. I got a lot of whippings. Did you deserve them? I asked. Truth be known, I don't think any child deserves corporal punishment, but I was interested in Raymond's point of view. <clears throat> I don't know. I got a lot of them, he said. In your opinion, I asked, did the spankings get out of hand? You know, did they spank too much or too hard? Oh, yeah, he said, it was rough. I mean, my mama hit me with whatever she could find. I don't think she meant it. My granny was the one who hit me the most. Shoes, coat hanger, book, whatever. One of my aunties just hit me with her fist. But it wasn't too bad. She wasn't that big. Life is a series of choices. Every moment of every day presents dilemmas. A circumstance arises and we respond. A caregiver does what she thinks she has to do to make it to the next moment in time. A toddler, a boy, a teenager reacts and draws conclusions about what it means to be himself. For the next two hours, Raymond offered an unrehearsed but candidly eloquent discourse on the pitfalls of poverty, teenage pregnancy, domestic violence, parental substance abuse, and family neglect. Though he went into a lot more detail than what his mother provided, <clears throat> just as she told me he would and could, their stories largely matched. One of the subtler elements of conducting a psychological study is the role memory plays in the formulation of a person's identity. In the shadowy recesses of this teenager's mind were images of family members who had failed him, bullies who had made threats, caseworkers who dropped him off at treatment centers, promised to visit him soon and then didn't. Memories aren't like snapshots pulled from a shoebox or video recordings that offer a perfect recreation of an event. Instead, they are interpretations of people, places, happenings, successes, failures. People make memories. In turn, memories make people. Trust me, Raymond told me, you would not have liked my grandmother and you really would not have liked my Annie. You mean the one that bought you the one-way ticket to Waco? I asked. Yes. As soon as I walked in her front door, she did everything she could to get rid of me. So when she suggested that you come to Waco, I asked, what did you think? In actuality, I was asking Raymond to interpret his memory of this aunt. If I were to contact that aunt and ask her the same question, when you suggested Raymond come to Waco, what were you thinking? I'll bet you anything her response would vary substantially from his. So Raymond Davis's identity is formed by his understanding of the past. That statement is significant, not only as it regards Raymond Davis, but as it regards me and you. In essence, we translate what other people say and do. After telling me about the various institutions he'd been in, Raymond again spoke of his father. What he said was not particularly flattering. I'm not like my daddy, he said. He's no good. Nobody liked him. He hates people and they hate him. You should see the way he treats his girlfriend. I mean, it's awful. No way I'd do that. I treat my women right. No drugs, no hitting, no cheating. It's all good. I love my girls and they love me. The gleam in Raymond's eyes clearly communicated that his definition of love was physical. Plain and simple as that. He was unabashedly lusting right there in front of me. Mind you, Raymond is a 15-year-old teenager. When I was 15 years old, I was still scared of girls, and I had no earthly idea how to treat a woman right, at least not in the same context Raymond meant. Returning to his assertion that he was better than his father, I asked, so tell me, Raymond, what's the biggest difference between you and your father? <clears throat> Without hesitation, this handsome teen slightly pushed his chest forward and spoke. He barely raised his head upward and said, I believe in myself.
How's that, I responded. Has it always been that way? I mean, when you were a young boy, did you have confidence in yourself? When I was a boy? No, he said. I didn't believe in myself when I was little. Because, I asked, because of getting the hell beat out of me every day. But somewhere along the way, Raymond, you turn from a scared boy into a teenager who's not scared of anything or anybody. Raymond nodded, smiled, and said thank you to me as if I'd complimented him. One of the developmental necessities of adolescence is a focus on self. Each of us is continually responding to the question, who am I, throughout our lifespan. That issue is especially important to teenagers. Self-centeredness is prominent during adolescence. Like any other trait, it's, e it's neither good nor bad, but it can become either, depending on how well balanced it is. Self-centeredness is a character trait that, when it's out of whack, contributes to poor ethical choices. For example, shooting and killing a man. Just as there's more, more than one way to skin a cat, there's more than one way to be destructively self-centered. Some kids get there by being spoiled. Other kids get there by being abused or neglected. I'm simplifying here, but you get my point. <clears throat> Raymond had minimal help answering that all-important question, who am I? Implicitly, but quite consistently, he had been told he was unwanted, unloved, usually wrong, dispensable, worthless enough to hit, and forgotten. Raymond remembered, and he interpreted what he remembered. There's a curiosity about self-esteem. Almost everyone understands that too little of it <clears throat> limits personal growth, but too much of a good thing creates the same deficit. People with inflated worth have minimal uh, empathy capacity for others, and they give too much credibility to their own point of view. Following about three hours of intense conversation, Raymond and I called it quits for the day. I told him I'd be seeing him again soon. Prior to leaving the juvenile justice center that day, I stopped by a probation officer's uh, office to take care of a minor business matter. Within 15 minutes, I headed toward the front of the building, but before I reached the exit, the detention supervisor flagged me down. Hey, Lee, he said. Mr. Hines, the detention supervisor, asked, did Raymond give you any trouble? No, I said. In fact, we got along quite well. Why? Five minutes after he returned from visiting you, he stood on a table in his tank and leaped on one of the other boys and threatened to kill him. It came out of nowhere. None of us saw it coming. I had to move him to seg segregation. I did not see that cup of hot tea brewing. I couldn't help but feel grateful that he and I were outside Visitation 5 <clears throat> when the urge struck him to jump on someone. Raymond's going to be one interesting study. Let me leave you with a couple of questions. What do you remember about your youth? How accurate is your interpretation of the past? Put yourself in the shoes of people who raised you. What do you think their memories of you are? How, how accurate is their interpretation of the past? How accurate do you think your interpretation of the past might be? Do you leave room in your thoughts to reinterpret your history? I'm psychologist Lee Carter. I'll continue sharing my thoughts from this particular case study in an ongoing ser series of upcoming videos. My hope in this video is to remind you and me that we don't come to our place in the world in a vacuum. Keep an open mind as you ask yourself the question, who am I? I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. I'll look forward to seeing you again soon.